you're with me. Um, welcome back to the second day of the carceral policy policing and rape conference. Um, this morning we have two very interesting um, speakers. Um, our third speaker, Leonard, can't make it unfortunately. So we'll be having two speakers this morning. So each presentation will roughly be about 20, 25 minutes. And um, then we'll have an opportunity at the end to ask questions. Um, so my first speaker, um, Dr. Stella Nianzi, um, she is a Ugandan human rights activist, a medical anthropologist and poet. poet. She's also a political activist who campaigns for women and girls' rights, um, as well as the rights of LGBT um, 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 people. She is most known for her outspoken criticism of the Ugandan government. Um, she's also had her own personal experience of, of being in prison in the Luzira Women's Prison in Kampala. Um, so she is going to give a wealth of um, a wealth of knowledge and experience on on the issues today, and we welcome her um, online. So I will just put um, Stella on for you now. Hi, morning, I'm Stella. Hi, good morning. Um, can you please share my slides for me, or will I try to share? Great. Do you have them already? Stella, we've got your slides up for you, or you can share them yourself, which is easier. Um, uh, I'm not fussy. Um, sh shall I try sharing? Let, let me try sharing. Um, can you see this? Yes. Okay, so, right. So good morning, everybody. I am uh, honored to participate in this inaugural conference on casserole policy, policing and race. Uh, and to sit on a panel, it was initially for three, but now for two people entitled Prisons, Protest and Performance. My paper today um, entitled Subverting Colonial Continuities of Carcerality Through Audiovisual Links in Uganda is in fact my second offering to the much needed SOAS project that we are participating in. My first contribution to the space um, was a presentation entitled Musings of a Decolonial Radical Queer Feminist Ex-Con about Luzira Women Prison. And I gave it at the first workshop held on 29th April 2022. And that particular workshop was called The Colonialities of Incarceration Across the Global South. In those earlier musings, I examined my ability to write and publish a book of poems when I was um, not only a heavily guarded political prisoner sentenced to 18 months in maximum security prison for writing that was criminalized under charges of cyber harassment and offensive communication. So I wrote a poem. Um, and uh, I was charged with cyber harassment and offensive communication to President Yoweri Museveni. But also during my time in prison that time, many of my writings, my scribblings and notebooks were routinely confiscated and destroyed by prison wardresses. So the release of my book collection of poems a few days before my acquittal was delightful evidence of dissident prisoners' abilities. Okay, of a dissident prisoner's ability, because it's my experience I'm talking about, to defiantly write as a form of protest against unjust selective restrictions to specifically political prisoners of conscience. A number of other prisoners were actually allowed to write, were allowed access to library materials and books. In my case, all these were confiscated. And also when gifts were brought by visitors to the prison of either a notebook or a pen, um, or even readings, they were taken away from me and withheld during the entirety of my prison time. So the politics of my praxis as a knowledge creator of knowledge um, about Uganda's carcerality 
is to write against the prisons, drawing mainly from my lived experiences. And so I enter this space this morning yet again, not only as an academic scholar, so thank you for the introduction, with a PhD and years of published academic research, but also activist against the injustices meted out to prisoners. And so next time when I'm being introduced, please include prisoner activist uh, against prison systems. And uh, I think that I'm an activist now against the injustices meted out to prisoners and enabled by the asymmetries of power between the institutions of the judiciary, including courts, prisons, and the police on one hand, and prisoners, whether they are remanded, convicted, appealing conviction, or condemned to life sentence. So most importantly today, I speak with the confidence of an insider because I'm an ex-convict. I have been detained at least 20 times. I'm in the last five years in different police stations, mainly because of dissident peaceful protests against various forms of state repression, oppressive abuse of state power and systemic failures of government. I show there one of the pictures of my arrest during a peaceful protest by booted uh, police officers without face. Most times after these peaceful protests, I was released after a few days on police bond without charge, along with several other peaceful protesters, or court bail was given to me for charges that were later dropped and the cases dismissed for want of evidence. So that's the first layer of my engagement with prison systems in Uganda as a detained peaceful protester. I also want to add that for 33 days between 7th April 2017 and 10th May 2017, I was a remand prisoner at Uganda's only maximum security prison for women called Luzira Women's Prison on charges of cyber harassment and offensive communication against President Museveni because of a Facebook post in which I metaphorically called him a pair of buttocks. It was during this imprisonment that state prosecutors applied to court for permission to subject me to involuntary mental examination. Indeed, during my first week in prison, two government psychiatrists attempted to commence psychiatric evaluations on me, inviting my boldest form of protest. Not only did I fight off the intrusion of these state operatives within the prison, but I also petitioned the Constitutional Court of Uganda to provide interpretation of the old colonial relic of a law upon which the state prosecutors relied to apply to court to subject me to involuntary mental exam. The Mental Treatment Act came into force in 1964, two years after independence, as a revised version of the pre-independence mental treatment ordinance of 1935. And I just want at this point to say that we see government psychiatrists relying on a colonial law that was created to govern and discipline and penalize anti-colonial Ugandans who are writing uh, critically of colonizers during the time and their writings in order to be uh, criminalized and penalized, but also in order to deter other Ugandans from participating in these uh, activities, were then um, criminalized using the 1935 Treatment Act, which is the same act that these colonial state operatives in the post-independence moment in 2017 entered the Luzira Women Prison Court to try again and subject me to involuntary mental examination. So not only did I petition the Constitutional Court for uh, interpretation, thereby halting my subjection to involuntary mental exam up to today, but furthermore, I'm among the few Ugandans who interacted with and gave input to the parliamentary committee that reviewed the amended present day Mental Health Treatment Act. And I share this to show that I think my experiences within prison contributed to growing and further developing me as a dissident protester against colonial uh, continuities of subjugation within the prisons today. 
So the final evidence as an insider to the prison systems that many conference delegates can afford to examine uh, and write about objectively because of their outsiderness is the 475 days between 2nd November 2018 and 20th February 2020 that I spent as a remanded, convicted and appellant prisoner of Luzira Women Prison on second charges of cyber harassment and offensive communication to President Museveni and his family. I was sentenced to 18 months when found guilty because of a birthday poem I wrote criticizing the repressive, corrupt dictatorship in power. The events of my sentencing will form the basis um, of this presentation because they highlight how as a prisoner I was agentic and I utilized the prison grounds, the prison officials, prison technology, and prison injustices exercised in collusion with the trial magistrate assigned to my court case to perform a subversion of the very prison system that sought to exert a continuity of colonial injustices of carcerality upon me. And so one may pose to ask, how does a mere lone prisoner subvert the powerful colonial continuities of violence, subjugation, abuse of rights to a fair trial, institutionalized and given legitimacy when a magistrate of court colludes with the prison structures? Like, how is it even thinkable? How can a lone woman who was found guilty the day before subvert the powerful structures of state, blindly fulfilling the vain wishes of a 35-year-old military dictatorship? In my case, I was a political prisoner this time, being sentenced for offending the president. This was one of the most politicized criminal court cases in Uganda. So moving beyond the framing of prisoners as victims beholden to a powerful oppressive carceral system and building upon my history of dissidence within the courts, I mean, I discuss challenging um, the torture of prisoners through my own torture when I was bitten by prison wardresses leading to the miscarriage of my baby and I was able to challenge this through the formal structures of applying to the Uganda Human Rights Council. I also went on to challenge through public court away from the formal judicial system by writing heavily against the injustices practices out practiced in courts um, when I was released and my Facebook timeline became a uh, people's court where we tried judicial and prison officials who are involved in my own lived experiences of torture as a prisoner. And so I build on this and I explore the different ways in which I subverted prison authority and simultaneously desecrated the temple of justice, sentencing me for the audacity to write metaphorically, write graphically, and write critically about dictator Yoweri Museveni. I will turn briefly to the audiovisual link technology that was first launched on 17th August 2016 in Uganda by the then Chief Justice Honorable Justice Bart Katurebe. Because this for me is a state instituted innovation of technology to continue asserting the authority and power of the prison system in Uganda. The innovation was greatly hailed for its ability to enable courts to take evidence, to receive testimony from vulnerable children uh, and elders and other endangered minors, including whistleblowers. The audiovisual link technology was envisaged to reduce the costs and wastage of time associated with hearing court cases to conclusion, thereby eventually putting an end to the delays and backlog of court cases. With funding and technological support from UNICEF, the judiciary installed closed circuit cameras connected to TV monitors, huge screens in the high courts of a number of districts, including Kampala, Gulu, Fort Porto, Mbale, Mbarara, Arua, and Masindi. So the giving or receiving of evidence through electronic means without a person physically appearing in court was to be governed by a statutory instrument, this is important, called the Judicature Audiovisual Rules Number 26 of 2016. While scholars have mainly praised the effects of this innovation, particularly in the COVID-19 lockdown moment, I 
as an ex-convict, I am appalled that technology, technological innovation, which was created to protect vulnerable people such as children, was appropriated by the judiciary in collusion with Uganda prison services to violate my constitutional rights to a fair trial. Most political prisoners who have been tried using the audiovisual link technologies were male politicians and male political activists from a range of opposition political parties. Several other criminals tried because of emergency health conditions during COVID-19 lockdown also appeared on audiovisual links. Always the postures of the prisoners presented through audiovisual link were humble, submissive, subdued, and well disciplined, giving the indication of pure reform and rehabilitation due to the time spent in prison. I share right here um, uh, a slide with Bobby Wine a leading presidential candidate in the recently concluded elections in Uganda. And one can tell that although he is a dissident in all ways, an opposition activist, he is acting all subdued and disciplined as if he wouldn't harm a fly. Then enter Stella Nyanzi, that's myself, on the day of her sentencing. I strategically stripped in protest rapidly jiggled my bared breasts, repeatedly raised my middle fingers and poetically hurled insults against the injustices of Uganda's courts during my sentencing to 18 months imprisonment because of a poem that I wrote was deemed a form of cyber harassment of President Museveni and his family. I share because of the of the conditions of uh, was it safe 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 usage that are shared for this conference, I can only share my bare breasts. But alongside this, I was hurling. Uh, I haven't shared a picture of my bare breasts, but I can only share me and my bra and my mouth open, hurling insults and and profanities at the justice system. Alongside this, my middle fingers were raised. I threw water at the cameras and I called the magistrate trying me a number of um, not very good metaphors. Alongside my activity in a male prison for condemned and convicted male prisoners and unbeknownst to me in the courtroom, my My friends, family and um, members of my political opposition party were excited and responding to each of the howls, the hurled insults I was making. And alongside this was excitement, sitting up from their chairs, cheering and jeering, booing the chief magistrate. And unbeknownst to me in that moment, because I was secluded and isolated in the all male prison for convicted and condemned criminals in Uganda, one of the members of the court, one of my friends, perhaps one of my family, perhaps a stranger even carried a bottle of water and threw it at the magistrate who was captured on the court cameras and relayed to all TV stations which were covering my sentencing in Uganda. And uh, the picture, the image of the bottle, an empty water bottle hitting the magistrate's head in my absence from court was for me one of the most delight delightful forms of subversion. So this protest was live streamed directly through audiovisual links from Maction Bay Prison, Nuzira, to Buganda Road Chief Magistrate's Court, and simultaneously broadcast all over Uganda, Africa, and the rest of the world by local journalists and foreign correspondents present in court. 
Unexpectedly, I received backlash from moralists, jurists, staff of Uganda prison services, and regime apologists in Uganda. However, for me, it was important to contest against continued colonial subjugation and system systemic violation of my constitutional rights to a fair hearing. Why was I, as a remanded woman prisoner, driven under heavy armed escort without my consent, which is a condition for utilizing the audiovisual links, a condition that is written in the statutory instrument I referred to earlier? Why was I driven from Luzira Women Prison to an all male maximum security prison for convicted and condemned capital offenders instead of being physically taken to court for my sentencing? as is stipulated in the Constitution of Uganda. The expectation for prisoners of mandatory cooperation and fearful submission to carceral authority is a legacy of colonial practice. The total violation of prisoners' rights to informed consent to judicial processes enacted in collusion with decorated prison staff never goes questioned because colonized subjects lacked voice to speak back at their colonizers. Current weaponization of courts, contemporary weaponizationing, uh, weaponization of the court system to silence, quash, and deter resistance of colonized Africans is a colonial relic practiced unwittingly by Kada judicial officers appointed in the service of Museveni's unjust punitive totalitarian regime in Uganda. And so to to counter the threats that I was receiving from, from prison officials and a number of visitors who visited me after my sentencing and the display of my subversive undressing and profanities in, 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 in court, I instructed my lawyers to write to the Judicial Service Commission. This is the last uh, picture that I'm sharing. To write to the Judicial Services Commission of Uganda and complain about the improper conduct and abuse of power that in my view was enacted by the magistrate uh, assigned to my court trial. Uh, because of time, oh, I'm not doing too well for time. So perhaps I will end here and hopefully oh, have given some material that um, can lead to the discussion of possibilities of um, subverting colonial continuities of carcerality through audiovisual links uh, in, in, in Uganda. And I'm open to discuss the contents of the judicial um, audiovisual link statutory instrument because part of my response to people who say what I did was partake in criminal subversion is to say that actually the court system and the prison services, the structures violated the very regulations that created the audiovisual link system in Uganda. And what I hope to do is to continue writing um, defiantly in ways that speak against the power of the prison systems in Uganda. Thank you very much and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. So much, um, Dr. Stella, um, such a compelling, um, wonderful way of you know, um, subverting um, systems that we were discussing all of yesterday in the conference that how we recognize all of these injustices and each and every one of us are thinking in our minds of the different ways that we can resist and disrupt these continuities, historical continuities for um, the global south. Um, now we want to um, move on. Um, um, Dr. Stella, we're going to have some questions towards the end. So we just um, ask you to, to wait around until the question time. Um, now we're going to move on to Dr. Annie Finks. Uh, another interesting um, scholar. Um, she is a 
independent scholar and artist um, and a visiting research fellow in sociology at Goldsmiths University of London. Uh, she brings an interdisciplinary and a visual archival approach to, to the issues uh, of colonial violence um, and the colonizing geographies of Kenya and historic Palestine. So we are really looking forward um, to the presentation this morning, which will be a, a visual approach. And um, um, Dr. Sphinx, I'm going to press play now. Um, did, did you want to say a few words um, before, or should I just go ahead and play? Just so you know, you're on mute. Go ahead, I don't need to speak before I'll speak at the end. We'll play this now. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Rami. Thank you. Do, do you want to share share a few words before we go into questions? Uh, yeah, maybe just a brief explanation. I mean, like Stella, I was part of an earlier workshop with um, with, with the unit, and I spoke together with Wendy Kimari, and we had produced a paper on the carceral legacy um, punishment, carcerality and the legacies of settler colonial punishment in Nairobi, in which we sort of developed um, a matrix of practices that, that, that have been embedded in the, through the colonial system into current policing and incarceration practices. And this work, because the visual is very much part of my practice, so this work on Palestine and Kenya came out of a series of exhibitions, firstly on Palestine, and then I took on Palestine to Nairobi, and I had made work supported by Wadigui Kimari in Matare, which is an informal community in East Nairobi, and then I set the um, on Palestine in conversation with Makare uh, originally as an exhibition at Goldsmiths and then um, as this as hauntings. Um, I think my main, I won't say very much about it, but my main emphasis in this work is really to look at what has been emptied out through the colonial, through colonial violence and how the material tells us not only of that history but also of its presence in the now um, and how it's manifested people's lives and the conditions of both the material environment and the social and political environment. I don't need to say more now, people want to know. That's great, it's a conversation. Um, thank you so much, um, Dr. Randy. I'm going to open the floor up to questions now. But I wanted to say that I was struck by two things um, in the presentation. Firstly, how challenging silence is. And, um, you know, um, we, we like to fill the air with words. And um, just how challenging it was to, to, to look at the photographs. And secondly, the other thing, that struck me and um, the photographs spoke for themselves. But the second thing that struck me was how stunningly beautiful the natural environment was. And you could not believe that so much bloodshed and so much pain existed in those natural environments. And it caused you to want to look back at the history, you know, so it, it, it's so firmly grounded in history, you know, so I got so much from it, but I just want to see if there's anyone who has questions um thank you dr annie i really enjoyed that um it was i like what you're saying about environments that have been emptied out when you were taking pictures in more sort of urban settings and ones with people what were you thinking and how does the sort of being emptied out or legacies of colonial violence yeah just some, some more thoughts particularly in like the urban one urban pictures um well, differently in Palestine and in Nairobi. In Palestine, the, the, the urban is a manifestation of colonial violence. So the image of the boys with the police, you know, just through the, through the archway, tells you everything you need to know about um, the colonial control of Palestine and Palestinian space. So in that sense, the urban is an is an is a narrative of current of historical and current conditions um in kenya it's slightly different except that i'm working in a neighbor in a neighborhood in east nairobi that was um that has a history of mamao that has a history of colonial violence and that has a history of state neglect and so um I don't know what, what can I say really. Like it's in the what I'm interested in those spaces is what the material tells us 
about the, about both the historical and the conditions of living like now and how they how they inform and construct each other. Thank you. Thank you. I have another question. So this is a question actually for Dr. Stella. That are we able to also ask yes. those Dr. questions now? Yes. Dr. Stella, are you hearing us? Loud and clear. Yes, OK. I, I wanted to say thank you so much for your moving and generative presentation. The question that I had was about that moment when you used the CCTV in the courts to kind of subvert the structure. I was thinking about call and response when you were explaining how that went. And, and the call and response action of you using your body and your voice and the emphasis you have described as um, the ability to be rude elsewhere and this vision that you said um, unknown to you all of these people elsewhere in their homes cheering in the prison cheering even in the courtroom for someone to throw the bottle at the um, judge i was thinking about the level of trust it takes to kind of do the call and hope for a response. I was wondering if that dynamic is how you think of the power of subversion, or is it more, more of an individual act? Right, um, difficult question. Thank you for the question. Um, um, so, so you're you're making assumptions <laughs> that uh, because you say to me uh, in that moment, and you said it really slow as you started in that moment in court. Now, in that moment, I wasn't in court. Um, I was in a male prison with men who hadn't seen woman body for years, depending on how long their convictions were, their sentences were. I was surrounded mainly by male prison wardresses. Um, I think I wasn't expecting a response. Part of my rage at the violation of the statute or the, the instrument governing this new technology was how it was violated by the court yeah and i was thinking nobody explained to me what the procedures are nobody showed me where the camera is nobody showed me where the microphone is i don't know if anybody is out there i knew that the magistrate sentencing me was there because i could see her face when I began screaming, you know, fuck the justice system, fuck the courts, excuse the German, this is very small German, um, compared to the expletives that I used. But when, when I began saying that, my screen was blanked, my volume was taken away. So I wasn't sure what was happening, throwing the water in the direction of what seemed to be like the technology man was for me to test that where is where is the person controlling what presentation I have. And so I wasn't expecting any response. I was just being defiant in. I thought I can't go out. They're going to sentence me. I can't go out silently. Mm -hmm. I have appealed to the Constitutional Court. I have appealed to the Uganda Human Rights Commission. I have appealed through public media. I have appealed. I had a number of appeals during my court and nobody is responding. So rather than rely on the institutions, I'm going out with one last bang. Mm -hmm. And I was pleasantly, pleasantly surprised when I was thrown in cons solitary confinement uh, and 
10 days later, I received the first visitor who asked me, why did you uh, show the whole of Uganda your naked breasts? Why were you jiggling your breasts in court? Who does that? And I thought, wow, the whole of Uganda saw this. <laughs> and um, during the same moment, I, I, I heard about how could you instruct people to hit the magistrate with a bottle? So I don't condone violence. Um, and I think that magistrates and judges must be protected at their places of work. However, I didn't instruct anybody to do this. <laughs> that is how powerful the random acts of madness, because I'm called a mad woman, that is how powerful they were. I was thinking, how do I speak one last truth at the time of my sentence, if I've been denied voice and audience, access to my lawyers, I am in, I am isolated, really isolated and surrounded by everything strange. It is beautiful there was a response. I understand at every moment when I paused to drink some water or catch my breath, they were cheering and jeering and raising of hands and singing of songs in the courtroom as the magistrate read the trial, I mean, the footage is there on, online if people want to see it. But I think for me that then, then, then while I thought I was acting as an individual, uh, the generative power of community um, helped make this subversive. Had I done this alone and there was no counter, there was no complementary action, I think it wouldn't have been as powerful. I had been threatened with um, opening of new charges around contempt of court, but the sort of backlash that the prison spokesperson met in response to these publicized threats was amazing. And I find out all of this uh, maybe a year later when I am released from prison, because again, I wasn't aware. The only indication of of, of ah, there must have been action, was two women who were arrested along with four men in the courtroom because of the uh, chaos and disorderly disruption that happened after the magistrate received the bottle on her head. Um, and they say to me, it was powerful, it was glorious, yes, we're in prison, but there's no way to speak to these courts in ways for them to hear. I haven't answered your question properly, but I've tried. I hope it suffices. Yes. yes. yes it does. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, uh, I have a question that I'd like to throw up to um, both women. Um, I have been so inspired by both of your um, courage, um, um, Dr. Nancy, um, be able to stand up and to speak out in, in that kind of environment. It takes a lot of courage. Um, what causes you to have this, this, this mental resilience? What, what, what keeps you going? I'm a researcher and there are times that, you know, you get a little bit down and you say, you know, am I, um, you know, is what I'm doing reaching others? Is it being successful? What keeps you going? What what motivates you to continue, especially in such challenging and um, what what would you call it? Um, a politically charged, politically charged topics. Could I um, start? Could we start with you, um, Dr. Sphinx, and then um, we'll go, go back to um, Dr. Stella. Um, thank you for your question. Um, I don't know that I think of it as being courageous. I think of it as being inevitable and necessary. So, um, and, uh, and part of that has to do with my own biography in a sense, like the work on the work that I've done in the last few years on Palestine comes out of 20 years of activism and academic research into the conditions of colonial control. And um, part of my interest, because, because the, the camera is part of my being, like it's always in my hand, um, it, it's like I'm, and because I'm interested in the spaces that have been emptied out, because to me they manifest colonial violence. 
um, I just take the images. I mean, there have been moments in Palestine where I've kind of gone, uh-oh, I'm going to get out of here, <laughs> you know, um, where it's been kind of a little bit iffy, but I've never, yeah. And the work in Kenya is slightly different because I was, oh, my biography, I was born in Kenya in, at the beginning, in the early days of the um, state of emergency, the British state of emergency. My parents were refugees. So it's a complicated history and a complicated set of relationships that I started, I've always been aware of, I've always been kind of concerned with. Um, and my family left Kenya just before independence. But it was at the High Court hearing of the Mau Mau case against the British government for compensation for this treatment in the detention camps that I understood that my work in both Kenya and Palestine, because at the time there was a mass um, hunger strike in, in the prisons of Palestinians in the prisons in Israel and I was sitting listening to the elders speak about their experience in the detention camps and I understood that in both Kenya and Palestine this was about the state of emergency and so then I spent a number of years investigating the state of emergency materially so I went to Kenya I went to the sites I met people um, and in a way, it was kind of like, it was time. It was time that I began this work. It was time. And courage, I don't know, necessity. Like, it was, it was necessary for me to do this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Annie. Um, I, I'm very glad that you gave, gave us that history because <laughs> I felt I could see that love for the country <laughs> that came out in your photographs. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Dr. Stella. Right, so, um, ah, video, okay. So I, um, I, again, I mean, I think for me, um, echoing very much what Annie said, um, um, it's not courage, but in terms of methodology, I really would have loved to have a camera in prison because, again, the assumption that what we see, I think, as curated selves of prisoners when they appear in public, <laughs> we are cleaned up, we are smelling nice, we are dressed in our dress, we've probably had breakfast from visitors, and the, <laughs> what one sees when prisoners incarcerated prisoners show up in public through the court system or hospital or upon release is a very small, very, very small part of what actually happens. I would have loved to have cameras in the prison cells when I was beaten up and totally, totally out of it. And when I was so discouraged because a whole book of poems had been confiscated and burnt in my presence. Or when we were grieving over a, a, a prisoner, an inmate who died because they stopped taking their antiretrovirals. Or when a woman gave birth at night on the floor because the prison wardresses on duty were sleeping and didn't come to open the ward. Um, but in those moments, it wasn't so glorious and dissident and defiant, but it was very much about, oh God, like totally beaten, totally giving up. Um, and, and some of the work I would love to go back into the prison and do necessitates sneaking a camera, <laughs> sneaking a camera into that place because it, it's powerful, but also colonial surveillance allowed the prisoners to have access to all the, the information they wanted about us to photograph prisoners, but neighbor for us, the prisoners to do the same. In terms of courage for me, so it's not courage, it's it's very much, I think the last word that 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 Annie gave was it's it's necessity. 
for me, for example, in that courtroom, I was thinking, how, how do I go out silently? How do I just bow out? I can't, like I must do something. I remember I was in my periods and I tried to bend over and raise my skirt, but I'm too short and the the lectern covered me and I thought, oops. <laughs> um, and and I, I was just trying at pulling at straws. How do I speak back when all my power, my, my power relied on having the people in the courtroom. How do I do something back? It was resistance, it was defiance, it was dissidence, it was innovative, it was experimental. Sometimes it flopped totally, <laughs> it flopped and invited beatings for me. Um, and, and, and there wasn't courage because for me there wasn't an alternative. The alternative would be for colonial violence to win, for, for the dictatorship to win. And that was not acceptable. And, and so it's only much later because you said, um, what gives you this mental resilience? How do you know if, if what you're doing is, is successful, um, especially in such politically charged environments? I think in my case, there's no alternative but to do something in my case. And I'm glad that some of, of these things went well, but there are also some regrettable actions, like when I spoke out against beating of prisoners and I was beaten and I lost my child. There is no courage or glory in that and they'll never be redress. So what, what gives me courage and resilience is those, those violences that are written on me, in my womb, on my body, in my lineage, that are then written out of the record, I think they give me a rage, unnecessary rage and necessary anger to keep going. So is that good enough? Thank you Thank so you. much. Um, it's so inspiring to hear both of you ladies speak. And um, I know that we have left here, um, um, you know, charged up, ready to, to work towards our goals, our own activism. Um, is there, are there any more questions? Yeah. I have a question, um, if that's okay for Annie. Um, it relates actually to Gabriel's um, previous question and your reflections on the urban um, as colonial violence. Uh, and I, I noticed in your video um, that lots of the images were of homes or, or, or dwellings. Um, and uh, I wondered if you would um, be able to expand a little bit on uh, carcerality in relation to colonial architectures or, or logics of domesticity, um, if I was right to, to pick up on that from, from your video. Uh, yes, yeah, sure. Um... I'll talk about Nairobi um, because it's more visually kind of obvious to me. So, Matare was built as a, had been kind of constructed and then was um, undone. And then over years, people have basically built their own dwellings. You know, they they're vulnerable, they're precarious, they're made of cardboard and fabric and bits of wood and they're very vulnerable. And then in other parts of East, East Nairobi, um, of Eastlands, um, there are, and you saw some of these images, there are some houses, dwellings, that were built by the colonial administration to house the workers from Nairobi men, single men. And so they were constructed as single people dwellings. And now Nairobians are extending them with Mapati extensions um, to try and turn them into family dwellings. Um, and there's other parts of East Nairobi that I don't know so well where the colonial administration constructed sort of garden garden communities like we know, well, I know them from Australia, um, where dwellings were built around, you know, a, a central open open air space. But in Eastlands, um, that's kind of what you encounter. So in Matari itself, it's, a, it's an informal community built by the people who live there. And they've been coming to Matari in waves 
since the 1950s um, from all parts of Kenya. And in, uh, it's different in Palestine. So in, in the old city of Palestine, the old city of Jerusalem, you've got this ancient construction, um, which is divided, which is policed, which is surveilled. Um, well, the Arab, the, the Palestinian part of it is under constant surveillance. And it's a divided, it's a divided city with um, newly built, extended community to the west and an increasingly um, enclosed um, Palestinian community to the east. Does that? Yeah, th thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Any more questions? No, I, we just want to thank um, Dr. Stella. And, um, so much. and I would like I would like to thank Dr. Stella personally. Thank you so much. Very nice to see you again. Thank you very much. It's an honor for me to share space with you again. And uh, shall I should I ever visit Madare? Maybe I will look for these images. Yeah. Sure you'll find them. I'll be there. And uh, thanks to the School of Law for this, I think, amazingly rich and necessary um, project. It's an intervention that we need. Thank you very much for your contribution. Thank you. I'll see you for now.